We've talked about frameworks. Now we're going to talk about services. This is where you extend the, the cloud. The idea is, is that an app can really only do so much on its own within its framework. Eventually, it's going to need to persist something. It's going to need to interact with, with other systems. It's going to need to send messages. Um, so you need to take, you, the cloud has to offer more than just an application runtime. It, it has to offer a, a surface area where people, where we and others could extend the cloud with these things that we've, we call services. Um, from a developer perspective, what you're looking for in, in, a, in the service ecosystem is a friction-free way to kick the tires and, and try a service and, and see if you like it. You know, figure out what all the fuss is about Redis or, or this SQL system or that SQL system. Learn how, to, how these services work in kind of a middleware hell free environment. That's something that, that uh, Rod had talked about. And then from the service author's perspective, what do you, what's attractive to those guys? Well, the same thing we did with the, the ability to control the state of the system and your apps using HTTP and JSON, we applied the exact same model to the services ecosystem. And so the services that you see today are actually going to use the exact same thing that any third party who wants to actually add a service into the system of any target cloud will use. And it's HTTP and JSON again in terms of announcing its availability, scoping it to, a, let's say, a private beta set of users, offering different capabilities, and provisioning and deprovisioning the services. Yeah, I, I think you saw some of that in, in Romney Voss's demo where you know, he picked a service from a pick list and dragged it in, into his app. And, it was, and, and that drag drop basically made that service available to the app. Do you want to show that, what that looks like on the command line and, sure. and how services work on the command line? And so, um, Let's switch to the demo machine. Okay. Again, doing the info, just simply saying, hey, what does, what's the target cloud that I'm actually pointing at? Um, from the command line, you can actually say, okay, what services does the system that we're pointing to actually offer me? And so what Romney Boss was showing you in STS is what the command line is showing you also, which is currently this one has MySQL, a Redis, and a MongoDB available to actually do. So I, as a developer on this cloud, if I want to use any one of those, I just, I just use it. I don't have to configure anything or run any apt gets or edit config files or rebuild any libraries or run make or anything? Nope. So for example, this is again our, for me. Our, our demo apps that we've been running and I just pushed one called ENV. It's just a small little app. But now I want to, let's say I want to bind data, uh, bind a service to it. And I'll pick the Redis service, which we saw on the list. And I'm going to say, just go ahead and bind that to my ENV app. And this is similar to what Rami Voss and Mark were showing in STS. And that was it. So what it just did was it actually said, OK, I understand the framework and the runtime that you're dealing with. I understand the service that you actually want to actually provision and bind into your application. I'll go ahead and create that service. And I'm, I'll show you now that when we do services now, you actually see both what's globally available to provision and what we've already provisioned, which is the one we just did down here, this Redis thing. It actually went out into the system, took your app, restaged it with everything it needed to know about the Redis instance that we just provisioned, started it, stopped it, Apologize, stopped it and restarted the app. And again, as you guys saw, that was about three or four seconds. And so now if we go to uh, ENV, and we can actually look at its environment, and this is a big eye chart I know, but underneath the services right here, this line, you can see now that there's this concept of, of Redis there. And what we can do also is, is that with framework detection like STS, Rails, things like that, when we understand how to officially bind a service into your application, we can do that. We can take that action. Does that make sense? So in other words, the environment is wrapped all the time, but as we understand a framework, we understand how it wants to interoperate with the database, we will do all the heavy lifting for you. So that's what a bound bean is in Java. I don't know what that means. I think it is. <laughs> and I think a bound bean means it, under, it read the environment variable and pulled some stuff out of it. And in, in Node, you just go to the environment variables. What, in all seriousness, though, what I think what we, we saw with both the combination of Rails and with STS and Spring is that, hey, you know, as the framework developer understands what this means in their world, the system can adapt. And it can adapt both in terms of a Spring developer, a Rails developer, a Node developer, the next framework we're going to yeah. do. And I, I think that's pretty powerful. I do. I mean, uh, you consume these things the way that your framework was designed to consume them. And that's, that's the point. We're not making the frameworks do it our way, we're doing it their way. And we understand what their way is. And, 
And because of that, we have to, you have to write a little framework adapter that we add to the cloud. And once you've done that, that cloud understands the framework. Um, to move along, I want to invite Roger up. He's EVP of Products and Technology at TenGen. TenGen is the company behind MongoDB. Hi. Hey. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, thank so, you. So tell us, what is Mongo and why did you guys create it? Excellent question. Uh, MongoDB is a non-relational database. And uh, what that means is that we don't use a relational model to persist objects. What we use is we use something that's called documents or JSON documents. And the really nice property of these documents is it's a lot easier to reason about. So if you're you know, manipulating objects in your database, you're typically not thinking about you know, 20 tables and 15 joins between them. What you're thinking about is you're thinking about a purchase order or you're thinking about a blog post or something like that. And so MongoDB thinks in those terms. We encapsulate that in, in something that's called JSON, Java, JavaScript object notation. And so it makes it very easy for developers to sort of design their, uh, you know, their, their data models, essentially. What's it great at? Well, we're really great at taking the pain out of database development. Uh, you know, um, I, I was at Oracle for quite some time. You know, like I know a lot about relational databases. But you know, the challenge that you have with a relational database is that the natural thing there is, is to take your object and split it apart in 15 different things, which makes it very difficult to reason about. And so then in the middle, you have this ORM layer that you know, reassembles all the pieces and so on and so forth. What Mongo is really, really great at is, is it's very good at you know, like avoiding that. So there's not an impedance mismatch between your program and you know, like what you store in your database. And therefore, it's actually very uh, good to, for agile development. So you know, you know the scenario. You develop an application that looks like this. You deploy it, and then you know, like literally days later, you find out that there's you know, like a bunch of requirements that will need to make you a whole bunch of changes. In a relational database, that's a very painful environment because you have to move data, you have to disable constraints. There's a lot of things that you have to do. In you know, our environment, you can just adapt the schema very, very easily. We have a dynamic schema, so if you wanted to add or remove or ignore certain fields in your database, you can just easily do that. So it really helps you know, iterative development. So if you kind of don't know what you're doing initially, that's okay because you can get there very, very easily. It seems like a, a new wave of, of programmers and frameworks are adopting things like Mongo that are very, yeah. very easy to use from the client side, very easy to get started very quickly. They yeah. understand JSON, they understand JavaScript type things. Um, one of the interesting backstories about how we got involved with Mongo was is that we, had, uh, we were working with a couple of people who wanted Mongo on the system. And uh, we said, okay, well, well, we'll try to set that up for you. And they said, it's just so easy to use from the client side, but I don't want to have to deal with setting up the server. And so what I think is powerful about these systems and these services is, is that, you know, I've obviously, Roger is here and we're working with you guys very closely to make sure that that backend service is configured and runs as best as it possibly can, given the talents of TenGen. Yeah. Yet the developer just sees it as something on the list and go, "Ooh, I like that. I want to use that." And just goes ahead and binds it into Node using Mongoose, Mongo Mapper, and Ruby on Rails, and of course the Spring Data frameworks that we are developing here at Axie VMware. Yeah, you kind of touched on it. I mean, one of the things that's very important, and it, it sort of echoes. The, uh, the things that Rod was talking about, you know, like from our perspective, we want to, we don't know what framework is, is the best. Okay? There's many, many different frameworks, right? And so, you know, from a MongoDB perspective, you know, we, we support all of the major and, and even minor, you know, frameworks out there so that if you're very comfortable developing, you know, in Java, what you can do is you can use that as your framework. If you're very comfortable in Rails, you can use that framework. I mean, we go all the way to Lisp and Haskell and Fortran and, you know, like you name it. So, so it's really, you know, what we want to do is is we want to be a ubiquitous data store underneath all these various different frameworks, but really make it very easy to sort of natively think in your programming language or framework about how to store you know, and how to manipulate data. Where did the name come from? Yeah, the name, uh, that's a great question. The name uh, came, comes from uh, Humongous. Um, and you know, initially, maybe the thought was to you know call it Humongous uh, DB, but that's kind of a mouthful. It's kind of a bad <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So we uh, abbreviated to to, uh, to Mongo. Mongo is, DB. Is there a canonical app that people would associate with Mongo that we can try to demo? Is that? Yeah, there is a, there is a canonical app. Uh, you know, like internally, what we do is is we post we're a database, so it's actually very hard to kind of demo it, right? Because you know, like we can type in commands, and that's you know not very sexy, really. Uh, so we have um, we have a canonical app, which is the blog. That's the thing that we demo. But what we did for uh, for this event is we we built a little shell that actually has a tutorial in it 
to uh, you know, like it shows you how. So you guys, uh, you guys built an app and deployed it on Cloud Foundry. Yeah, it was literally, you know, I think it took us all of about an hour to be really honest, and then we did a couple of uh, runs through it. But you know, it was very, very easy to uh, cool. to do and deploy. Let's take a look. Yeah, please. So where am I going? You're going to uh, mongo.cloudfoundry.com. There it is. Yeah, so what this is, this is a, uh, this is a shell. It's a JavaScript uh, shell. And if you type in tutorial, then okay. what, what we'll do is, is we'll take you through you know, tutorial of Mongo. Uh, it takes about you know, maybe 15 minutes, you know, maybe 30 minutes to go through it. And once you've been through this tutorial, you basically know everything you need to know to get started with an application on, uh, on Mongo. It's, it's really it's that simple and that concise. Um, What's the app written in? Uh, the app itself is, is like, uh, this is JavaScript. This is JavaScript console. So, um, you know, what, um, uh, you know, like one other thing that we did on the, um, you know, like on this app we have, if you type in contest, we added a little, you know, sort of Easter egg in that. We have a special collection in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this application. It's called info. So if you save your email address and your name to that collection, then uh, we'll raffle off a, uh, a few items for you. Uh, there's a couple of backpacks and some goodies. Uh, we also have some mugs that we'll, uh, we'll send out to everybody. But you have to write an app. To yeah, go through the tutorial and then save. Write a sample and then, app. Yeah, and then save your, you know, your, your name and address. And you so could probably know. run that sample app on Cloud Foundry because you could. Cloud Foundry supports Mongo. You get extra points if you deploy this on a different domain. Extra points. <laughs> you, you accept the contest from other. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so what are the challenges of Mongo? I guess the number one is like, when do you guys take down Oracle? When we take down <laughs> Oracle, well, that's always a difficult question because I have. Or is know, there room for for relational, non-relational? There's absolutely room for uh, relational and non-relational. So the way we look at the world is that um, you know, relational has been so successful that it's actually been deployed in all kinds of scenarios where it really should not have been deployed because it was the only choice, right? So like if you had data, you were going to store it in either MySQL or Oracle or Postgres, but that was about it. Um, I think that what's happening now is, is that we're seeing that um, a lot of like the new applications are actually using MongoDB, you know, just because you know they're, they're just taking this up. And where people have a pain point around relational, we'll think we'll take a few you know points of market share, you know, hopefully from Oracle over there. That would be awesome. That'd be great. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you for coming up and joining us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, we've seen the multi-platform, multi-language, multi-framework nature of the past. We've touched a little bit on services, and you've seen how easy it is to try a service, to test drive it, to learn something about Mongo. I mean, having a tutorial baked into the app on a cloud that supports it, that's, there's, there's no better way to learn and kick the tires than, than systems like that. And one of the interesting things, too, that we, also, we saw in, in Romney Ross's and Mark's demo was is they immediately said, I'm going to use both a key value store as a caching system and a MySQL database. And we talked about this earlier. We really think that if that VMC services list starts growing, that application developers, that friction point of saying, ooh, I'm going to try this and try to design this into my app to use this for a specific problem is going to be a lot more adopted.